The seventh law of achievement is the law of preparation, which says that perfect performance is preceded by painstaking preparation. The mark of the serious person and the real professional in any field is that he takes more time to prepare thoroughly than the average person does. The non-serious person or the non-professional always attempts to bluff or to wing it. He tries to get by with the minimum of preparation without realizing that his level of preparation is immediately evident to everyone around him. One of my favorite quotes, which has had a powerful effect in shaping my life and attitude, comes from Abraham Lincoln, who said, I shall study and prepare myself, and someday my chance will come. He recognized, as do all great men and women, that painstaking and sorrow preparation is the key to the future. The first part of the law of preparation is simply do your homework. It's the details that trip you up every single time. My friend Joel Weldon gave a wonderful talk a few years ago entitled Elephants Don't Bite. The essence of his talk was that it was the mosquitoes of life, the small things that tend to be ignored, that cause you the most trouble. No one ever gets bitten by an elephant, but people get bitten by mosquitoes all the time. His message was that if you want to get to the top of your field, you must be fastidious about the little things because, as a minister once said, God is in the details. The second part of the law of preparation comes from the business writer Peter Drucker who wrote that action without thinking is the cause of every failure. Action without taking the time to think through the details and their possible ramifications seems to be the underlying cause of most failure in life. The opposite of this statement is that action preceded by thinking and planning is the cause of virtually every success. This doesn't mean that you'll automatically be successful if you plan thoroughly in advance, but it means that you must almost inevitably fail if you don't do it. The third part of this law comes from Benjamin Trigo, who said that if it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. Details are important, it's true, but you need to think through the value and importance of each detail before you overcommit your time and your resources to them. The eighth law of achievement is the law of forced efficiency. This law states that the more things you have to do in a limited space of time, the more you will be forced to work on your most important tasks. This is another way of saying that there's never enough time to do everything but there's always enough time to do the important things. The more you take on, the more likely it is that you'll be forced to think, analyze, and evaluate your tasks and activities in such a way that you spend your limited mental and physical energy on just those tasks that are the most vital to your success. There are two parts of the law of forced efficiency. The first is that there will never be enough time to do everything that you have to do. The busier and more successful you become, the more true this statement will be. If you have lots of time to do your work, it means that you are underemployed, underpaid, and well along on the low road to frustration and disappointment in your career. The fact is that you can only discover how much you can do by trying to do too much. You can only find out how far you can go by going too far. You discover how much you can take on by taking on more than you can do. The second part of this law, which is the key question in personal efficiency and time management, is to ask yourself continually, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? Always keep yourself on track and focus on your most important responsibilities by asking yourself hour by hour and minute by minute, what is the most valuable use of my time right now. The ninth law of achievement is the law of decision. It says that every great leap forward in life is preceded by a clear decision that leads to action. All high achieving men and women tend to be very decisive in their thoughts and actions. They think things through carefully, they decide exactly what they want, and then they make clear decisions and take action to make those decisions a reality. In your life, you've had several experiences where you've been unsure of what to do and you've resolved your dilemma by making a clear decision one way or the other. In looking back, you'll probably find that that 
was the turning point for you and that everything else flowed from the decision. The ability to make good decisions is one of the most critical thinking skills of the successful man or woman. In fact, in one study, the careers of managers who were promoted rapidly were compared to those of managers who were passed over for promotion. Researchers found the one distinguishing behavior between the two groups was that the more rapidly promoted managers were more decisive in doing their jobs. The interesting fact that came out of this study was that given written tests with hypothetical problems, both sets of managers were equally accurate in their answers. The more successful managers, however, on the job were willing to make decisions based on their answers while the unsuccessful managers were afraid to for fear of making a mistake. The very act of being decisive can be the critical factor that enables you to take command of a situation and move ahead more rapidly. We found that high achievers are not necessarily those who make the right decisions every time, but they are those people who make their decisions right. They accept feedback and self-correct. They take in new information and they change if necessary, but they are always decisive, always moving forward, never wishy-washy or vacillating in their attitudes toward life. The first part of the law of decision is simply this. Act boldly and unseen forces will come to your aid. It seems that when you grasp a situation and step forward courageously, a series of unseen forces, most of which are explained by the laws in this program, seem to emerge and help you to achieve your goals. Your very willingness to take action rather than to delay or procrastinate seems to bring universal powers to your assistance. The second part of the law of decision comes from the wonderful book by Dorothea Brand entitled Wake Up and Live. She wrote that the discovery that changed her life and the lives of thousands of others who heard it from her in her public talks was the simple success formula that says, act as if it were impossible to fail and it shall be. When you imagine that your success will be guaranteed if you simply take action and you act on that premise, a whole series of forces begins to support you and move you toward the attainment of your desires. So, when in doubt, Act as if it were impossible to fail and push forward. The third part of the law of decision comes from the famous Nike commercial which says, just do it. These three words really summarize one of the great formulas for success. Just do it. So, be decisive. Go for it. Take a chance. Act boldly and unseen forces will come to your aid. The tenth law of achievement is the law of creativity. It says that every advance in human life begins with an idea in the mind of one person. It's ideas that you generate that enable you to solve your problems, overcome your obstacles, and achieve your goals. Ideas are the keys to the future. It's hardly possible for you to achieve anything of note except to the degree to which you think and do something new and different from what's been done before. All it takes is a small innovation to lay the foundation for a fortune and great success in life. The first part of this law says that your ability to generate constructive ideas is to all intents and purposes unlimited. Therefore, your future potential is unlimited as well. Ideas are a mode of transportation, a vehicle that you can use to take you from wherever you are to wherever you want to go. Your job is simply to generate as many ideas as possible, to evaluate them carefully against your current goals, and then to take action on them. There's virtually no obstacle in life that you cannot overcome with the power of thought, with the power of creative concentration, with the power of ideas. The second part of this law comes from Napoleon Hill, who said in his famous words, Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Your mind is structured in such a way that you cannot at the same time have an idea and not also have the ability to bring that idea into reality. The very existence of an idea in your conscious mind means that you have within you and around you the capacity to achieve it. The only question you have to ask yourself is, how badly do I want it? 
The third part of the law of creativity comes from Napoleon Bonaparte, who said, the imagination rules the world. Everything you see around you is the result of what was initially a single idea in the mind of a single person. Our entire world started from thought brought into reality. The fourth and final part of this law comes from Einstein, who said simply that the imagination is more important than facts. There have been countless occasions in your life and the lives of others where the facts say one thing, but your ideas and creative energy enable you to do something completely different. Virtually every important turning point in your life will be marked by an idea that you've had at that time and that moment. All great changes in human life and human destiny begin with an idea that causes you to see things differently and to take action that you would not have taken in the absence of that idea. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever your situation, you have the creative capacity in the form of an infinite ability to generate ideas to solve any problem and achieve any goal. It's up to you. The eleventh law of achievement is the law of flexibility. This law says that success is best achieved when you are clear about the goal, but flexible about the process of getting there. This is one of the most important conclusions ever reached by high-achieving men and women. When you set a clear goal for yourself and make a plan, you usually have a fairly good idea of what it is you have to do to get whatever it is you want to achieve. However, a thousand things can change, each of which will require alterations in your plan of action. The most optimistic and enthusiastic people are those who are open and flexible and fluid in the face of the inevitable and the myriad changes required as they move toward the accomplishment of something that's important to them. The first part of the law of flexibility is that the experience of resistance and frustration is often an indication that you're doing the wrong thing. Whenever you feel that you're butting your head against the wall and not making progress, step back and re-examine your plan. Be sure that the goal that you're working toward is still the goal that you desire, and then sit down and make better plans. Take the mentality of a computer programmer. When he designs a computer program, he knows that the program will be full of defects when it's completed. No computer program ever works perfectly the first time it's tried. However, the programmer accepts this as a fact of life, and then begins to go back through the program step by step to remove the defects. When the programmer is finished, the program will operate perfectly. By the same token, whenever your plants don't seem to be bearing fruit, look in the mirror, re-examine your plans and redesign them until you have faultless plans that work and move you forward without anxiety and frustration. The second part of the law of flexibility is that you are only as free in life as the number of developed options that you have available to you. Your freedom and happiness is largely determined by the number of alternatives that you develop in case your first choice doesn't work. The more thoroughly developed your options and alternatives, the more freedom you have. If one course of action doesn't develop as you expected, you're fully prepared to switch. In my courses on decision making, once a decision has been reached, I encourage the participants to ask the question, what else would be a good decision in this situation? The very exercise of developing alternatives enables you to think more clearly and can be a major contributor to the level of achievement that you experience. The third part of the law of flexibility is that crisis is change trying to take place. Whenever you're experiencing a crisis or difficulty of any kind, stand back for a moment and ask yourself, what change is trying to take place that is being signaled to me as a result of this crisis? You may be having a crisis in your work, in your personal relationships, with your health or with your business. In almost every case, a crisis is an indication that something is wrong and that pursuing the same course would be an unwise thing to do. So, what is the change that's trying to take place in your life right now? And the fourth part of the law of flexibility is that errant assumptions lie at the root of every failure. 
Almost every failure you have will be based on an incorrect assumption that you've made and accepted without question. It's always a good exercise to clarify your assumptions, especially when things aren't going as well as you want. So, what are your assumptions? First, what are your explicit assumptions, the ones you're clearly aware of? And second, what are your implicit assumptions, the ones that you may be accepting without question? What if your most cherished assumptions were wrong? What changes would this dictate? How flexible and fluid would you have to be to redirect your course of action if something that you were assuming as a fact turned out not to be true at all? Whenever you make the right decisions and you achieve your goals on schedule, it's always because the assumptions that you were operating on turned out to be true. Many people go broke in starting their own businesses because they assume that there's a big enough market for the product or service that they propose to offer. They also assume that customers will switch from their current suppliers to them for no other reason than that they are in the marketplace. They sometimes assume that they have the talents and skills and abilities to provide the product or service at a competitive price and still make a profit. Well, your willingness to question your assumptions, to test your assumptions against reality, with the willingness to accept the possibility that you could be wrong, is the kind of attitude that will ultimately lead you to great achievement. Flexibility is considered to be perhaps the most important single quality necessary for success in our competitive society for the rest of the century and into the century beyond. The, the twelfth law of achievement is the law of persistence. This law says that your ability to persist in the face of setbacks and disappointments is your measure of your belief in yourself and your ability to succeed. Persistence is the iron quality of success. Sometimes your willingness to persist is your greatest asset and is the quality that separates you from everyone else. Sometimes the strongest thing you have going for you is your ability to persist longer than anyone else. The first part of the law of persistence is simply that persistence is self-discipline in action. It's when you face the inevitable setbacks and delays and disappointments and temporary defeats and you continue to persist in spite of them that you demonstrate to yourself and others that you have the character of self-discipline and self-mastery that is absolutely indispensable for the great success that you desire. Churchill summarized the second part of the law of persistence when he said, never give up. Never Never give up. Churchill believed, and he proved throughout his lifetime, that bulldog tenacity in the face of what appeared to be overwhelming defeat was often the critical quality that turned that defeat into victory. Earlier I mentioned that intense, burning desire is absolutely essential to the overcoming of obstacles and the achieving of great goals. For your desire to be intense enough, your goals must be purely personal. They must be goals that you choose for yourself, rather than goals that someone else wants for you, or that you want to achieve to please someone in your life. In goal setting, for the process to be effective, you must be perfectly selfish about what is that you really, really want for yourself. This doesn't mean that you cannot do things for other people, either at home or at work. This simply means that, in setting goals for your life, you start with yourself and work forward. The great question. One of the most important questions in goal setting is this. What do I really want to do with my life? If you could do or be or have anything at all in life, what would it be? Remember, you can't hit a target you can't see. You should return to this question over and over again in the months and years ahead. What do I really want to do with my life? In determining your true goals, you start with your vision, your values, and your ideals. When you begin, these will often feel a bit like fantasies, detached from reality. However, now your job is to make them concrete, like designing a dream house on paper. You start with your general goals and then move to more to more specific goals. One, what are your three most important goals in your business and career right now? Two, what are your three most important financial goals right now? Three, what are your three most important family or relationship goals right now? Or what are your three most important health and fitness goals right now? 
The flip side of the above questions is for you to ask, what are my three biggest worries or concerns in life, right now? What bothers you, worries you, concerns you, and preoccupies you, in your day-to-day -day life? What aggravates or irritates you? What is robbing you of happiness, more than anything else? As a friend of mine often asks, where does it hurt? Once you have identified your biggest problems, worries, or concerns, ask yourself. 1. What are the ideal solutions to each of these problems? 2. How could I eliminate these problems or worries immediately? 3. What is the fastest and most direct way to solve this problem? In 1142, William of Ockham, a British philosopher, proposed a method of problem solving that has come to be referred to as Ockham's razor. This way of thinking has become famous and popular throughout the ages. What Ockham said was that, the simplest and most direct solution, requiring the fewest number of steps, is usually the correct solution to any problem. Many people make the mistake of overcomplicating goals and problems. But the more complicated the solution, the less likely it is ever to be implemented, and the longer the time it will take to get any results. Your aim should be to simplify the solution and go directly to the goal, as quickly as possible. For example, many people tell me that they would like to double their incomes. If they are in sales, I ask them, what is the fastest and most direct way to double your income? After they have come up with a series of suggestions, I give them what I consider to be the best answer. Double the amount of time that you spend face to face with qualified prospects. The most direct way to increase your sales has always been the same. Spend more time with better prospects. If you don't upgrade your skills or change anything else about what you are doing, but you double the number of minutes that you spend face to face with prospects each day, you will probably double your sales income. According to studies that go back as far as 1928, the average salesperson today spends 90 minutes each day face to face with prospects. The highest paid salespeople spend two or three times that amount. They organize their days efficiently to assure that they spend more minutes in the presence of people who can and will buy their products or services. And the more time they spend with prospects and customers, the more skilled they become at selling. The better they get, the more they sell and the more they earn, and in less time. If you examined your work, you would find that 20% of what you do accounts for 80% of the value of all the things you do. In my advanced coaching programs, we teach our clients to identify those 20% of activities that contribute the very most value and then do twice as many of them. Instead of using their intelligence to juggle their time and accomplish a greater number of tasks, we teach them to do fewer tasks, but tasks of higher value. Some of our clients double their productivity, and subsequently, their income in as little as 30 days with this approach, even if they have been working for many years in the same position. Always look for the simplest and most direct way to get from where you are to where you want to go. Look for the solution that has the fewest number of steps. And most of all, take action. Get going. Get busy. Develop a sense of urgency. The best ideas in the world are of no value until they are implemented. As the poet said, the saddest words of mice and men are these, it might have been. In determining your true goals, use the magic wand technique. Imagine that you have a magic wand that you can wave over a particular area of your life. When you wave this magic wand, your wishes come true. Wave a magic wand over your business and career. If you could have any three wishes in your work, what would they be? Wave a magic wand over your financial life. If you could have any three wishes in your financial life, what would they be? Wave a magic wand over your family life and your relationships. If you could have any three wishes in this area, what would they be? If your family life were ideal in every respect, what would it look like? Wave a magic wand over your health and fitness. If you could have any three wishes with regard to your body and your physical well-being, what would they be? If your health were perfect, how would it be different from today? Wave a magic wand over your skills and abilities. If you could have any three skills or abilities developed to a high level, what would they be? In what areas would you like to excel? The magic wand technique is fun on the one hand, but quite revealing on the other. Whenever you imagine that you have a magic wand, your true goals in that area emerge. You can also use this exercise for other people who are not sure about what they want or where they are going. It is amazing what comes out when you ask this question. Here is another goal-setting question that reflects your true values. Imagine that you went to a doctor for a full medical checkup. Your doctor calls you back a few days later and says, I have good news for you and I have bad news for you. The good news is that, for the next six months, 
you are going to live the healthiest and most energetic life you could possibly imagine. The bad news is that, at the end of 180 days, because of an incurable illness, you will drop stone dead. If you learned today that you only had six months left to live, how would you spend your last six months on earth? Who would you spend the time with? Where would you go? What would you strive to complete? What would you do more of, or less of? When you ask yourself this question, what comes to the top of your mind will be a reflection of your true values. Your answer would almost always include the most important people in your life. Very few people in this situation would say, well, I'd like to get back to the office and return a few phone calls. In setting your true goals as an extension of imagining that you have no limitations, make up a dream list. A dream list is a list of everything you would like to be, have, or do in your life, sometime in the future, if you had no limitations at all. Mark Victor Hansen, co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, recommends that you sit down with a pad of paper and make a list of at least 100 goals that you want to accomplish in your lifetime. Then imagine that you have all the time, all the money, all the friends, all the abilities and all the resources necessary to achieve these goals. Let yourself dream and fantasize. Just write down everything that you would like to have as if you had no limitations at all. The amazing discovery you will make is that, within 30 days after writing out this list of 100 dreams, remarkable things will begin to happen in your life, and your goals will start to be achieved, at a rate that you cannot even imagine today. This seems to happen to virtually once they have written down at least 100 goals. You should give it a try. You could be amazed at the results. Here is another goal setting question, if you want a million dollars tomorrow, cash, tax free, how would you change your life? What would you do differently? What would you get into or out of? What would you do more of or less of? What would be the first thing you would do if you learned today that you had just received one million dollars cash? This is a way of asking the question, how would you change your life if you were completely free to choose? The primary reason that we stay in situations that are not the best for us is because we fear change. But when you imagine that you have all the money that you will ever need to do or be whatever you want, your true goals often emerge. For example, if you were currently in the wrong job for you, the idea of winning a large amount of money would cause you to think about quitting that job immediately. If you were in the right job for you however, winning a lot of money would not affect your career choice at all. So ask yourself, what would I do if I won a million dollars cash, tax-free, tomorrow? Here is another question to help you clarify your true goals. What have you always wanted to do but been afraid to attempt? When you look around your world, and you look at other people who are doing things that you admire, what have you always wanted to do is? Well, but you have been afraid of taking the chance. Have you wanted to start your own business? Have you wanted to run for public office? Have you wanted to embark on a new career? What have you always wanted to do but been afraid to attempt? In setting goals for your life, short and long term, you should continually ask yourself, what do I most enjoy doing in each area of my life? For instance, if you could do just one thing all day long in your work, what would it be? If you could do any job or full-time activity all the time, without pay, what would it be? What sort of work or activity gives you the greatest joy and satisfaction? The psychologist Abraham Maslow identified what he called peak experiences, those moments or times when the individual feels the happiest, most elated and exhilarated. One of your aims in life is to enjoy as many peak experiences as possible. You achieve this by thinking back and identifying those moments of peak experience in your past, and by then by imagining how you could repeat them in your present and future. What have been your happiest moments in life up to now? How could you have more of those moments in the future? What do you really love to do? You should have goals for social and community involvement and contribution as well. Think about what kind of difference you would like to make in your world. What organizations, causes, needs or social problems would you like to work on or in? What changes would you like to see? Who is there who is less fortunate than you that you would like to help? If you were independently wealthy, what causes would you support? Most of all, what could you do today to begin making a difference in your world? Don't wait until some future date when everything will be ideal. Instead, start today in some way. One of the most important areas of goal setting is your financial life. If you could earn and accumulate all the money you need, you could probably achieve most of your non-financial goals faster and easier than you can today. If your life were ideal, how much money would you like to earn each month, each year? How much would you like to save and invest each month and year? 
How much would you like to be worth sometime in the future? What sort of estate would you like to accumulate by the time you retire, and when would you like that to be? Most people are hopelessly confused about their financial goals, but when you become absolutely clear about them for yourself, your ability to achieve them increases dramatically. When you are absolutely clear about what you want, you can then think about your goals, most of the time. And the more you think about them, the faster they will materialize in your life. This process of asking yourself questions about your goals in each part of your life begins to clarify your thinking and make you a more focused and definite person. As Zig Ziglar says, you move from being a wandering generality to becoming a meaningful specific. Most of all, you reach the point where you can determine your major definite purpose in life. This is the springboard for great achievement and extraordinary accomplishment. Your major definite purpose will be the topic of the next chapter, and how to achieve it will be the subject of the chapters to come. Determine your true goals. 1. Write down your three most important goals in life right now. 2. What are your three most pressing problems or worries right now? 3. If you want a million dollars cash, tax-free, tomorrow, what changes in your life would you make immediately? 4. What do you really love to do? What gives you the greatest feelings of value, importance, and satisfaction? 5. If you could wave a magic wand over your life and have anything you wanted, what would you wish for? 6. What would you do? How would you spend your time, if you only had 6 months left to live? 7. What would you really want to do with your life, especially if you had no limitations? How many times do you think that people try to achieve their new goals before they give up? The average is less than one time. Most people give up before they even make the first try. And the reason they give up is because of all of the obstacles, difficulties, problems, and roadblocks that immediately appear as soon as you decide to do something that you have never done before. The fact is that successful people fail far more often than unsuccessful people. Successful people try more things, fall down, pick themselves up and try again, over and over again before they win through. Unsuccessful people try a few things, if they try at all, and very soon quit and go back to what they were doing before. You should expect to fail and fall short many times before you achieve your goals. You should look upon failure and temporary defeat as a part of the price that you pay on your road to the success that you will inevitably achieve. As Henry Ford once said, failure is merely an opportunity to more intelligently begin again. Once you have decided upon your goal, ask yourself, why am I not there already? What is holding you back? Why haven't you achieved that goal up to now? Identify all the obstacles that stand between you and your goal. Write down every single thing that you can think of that might be blocking you or slowing you down from moving ahead. Remember, you become what you think about, most of the time. In the area of problems and difficulties, successful people have a particular way of thinking that we call solution orientation. Successful people think about solutions, most of the time. Unsuccessful people think about problems and difficulties most of the time. Solution-oriented people are constantly looking for ways to get over, around and past the obstacles that stand in their ways. Problem-oriented people talk continuously about their problems, about who or what caused them, how unhappy or angry they are and how unfortunate it is that they have occurred. Solution-oriented people, on the other hand, simply ask the question, how can we solve this, and then take action to deal with the problem. Between you and anything you want to accomplish, there will always be problems or obstacles of some kind. This is why success is sometimes defined as the ability to solve problems. Personal leadership is the ability to solve problems. Effectiveness is the ability to solve problems. All men and women who accomplish anything of importance are people who have developed the ability to solve the problems that stand between them and their goals. Fortunately, problem solving is a skill, like riding a bicycle or typing with a typewriter, which you can learn. And the more you focus on solutions, the more and better solutions will come to you. The better you get at solving problems, the faster you will be at solving each subsequent problem. And as you get better and faster at solving problems, you will attract even bigger and more expensive problems to solve. Eventually, you will be solving problems that can have significant financial consequences for you and others. This is the way the world works. The fact is that you have the ability to solve any problem or to overcome any obstacle on the path to your goal, if you desire the goal intensely enough. You have within you, right now, all the intelligence and ability you will ever need to overcome any obstacle that could possibly hold you back. 
One of the most important breakthroughs in thinking in the last few decades was described by Elihu Goldratt in his book The Goal is The Theory of Constraints. This theory says that between you and anything you want to accomplish, there is a constraint or limiting factor that determines how fast you get to where you want to go. For example, if you are driving down the freeway and there is traffic construction that is narrowing all the cars into a single lane, this bottleneck or choke point becomes the constraint that determines how fast you get to your destination. The speed at which you pass through this bottleneck will largely determine the speed of your entire journey. In accomplishing any major goal, there is always a constraint or bottleneck you must get through as well. Your job is to identify it accurately and then to focus all of your energies on alleviating that key constraint. Your ability to remove this bottleneck or deal with this limiting factor can help you move ahead faster than perhaps any other step you can take. The 80-20th rule applies to the constraints between you and your goals. This rule says that 80% of your constraints will be within yourself. Only 20% of your constraints will be outside of yourself, contained in other people and situations. To put it another way, it is you personally who is usually the major roadblock that is setting the speed at which you achieve any goal that you set for yourself. For most people this is hard to accept. But superior people are more concerned with what is right rather than who is right. Superior people are more concerned with the truth of the situation and what they can do to solve the problem than they are with protecting their egos. Ask yourself, what is it in me that is holding me back? Look deep within yourself and identify the key constraints in your personality, temperament, skills, abilities, habits, education, or experience that might be holding you back from achieving the goals that you have set for yourself. Ask the brutal questions. Be completely honest with yourself. The primary obstacles between you and your goals are usually mental. They are psychological and emotional in character. They are within yourself rather than within the situation around you. And it is with these mental obstacles that you must begin if you want to achieve everything that is possible for you. The two major obstacles to success and achievement are fear and doubt. It is first of all, the fears of failure, poverty, loss, embarrassment, or rejection that holds the average person back from trying in the first place. This is why the average number of times that a person tries with a new goal is less than one. As soon as he thinks of the goal, these fears overwhelm him and, like a bucket of water on a small fire, extinguishes his desire completely. The second mental obstacle, closely aligned to fear, is that of self-doubt. We doubt our own abilities. We compare ourselves unfavorably to others, and think that others are somehow better, smarter and more competent than we are. We think, I'm not good enough. We feel inadequate and inferior to the challenges of achieving the great goals that we so much want to accomplish. Fortunately, if there is anything good about doubt and fear it is that they are both learned emotions. Have you ever seen a negative baby? Children come into the world with no doubts or fears at all. And whatever has been learned can be unlearned, through practice and repetition. The primary antidotes to doubt and fear are courage and confidence. The higher your level of courage and confidence, the lower will be your levels of fear and doubt, and the less effect these negative emotions will have on your performance and behavior. The way that you develop courage and confidence is with knowledge and skill. Most fear and doubt arises out of ignorance and feelings of inadequacy of some kind. The more you learn the things you need to know to achieve your goals, the less fear you will feel on the one hand, and the more courage and confidence you will feel on the other. Think about learning to drive for the first time. You were probably extremely tense and nervous, and made a lot of mistakes. You may have driven erratically and been a danger to yourself and others. But over time, as you mastered the knowledge and skills of driving, you became better and better, and your confidence increased. Today, you can quite comfortably get into your car and drive across the country with no fear or worry at all. You are so competent at driving that you can do it well without even thinking about it. The same principles apply to any skills you need to learn to achieve any goal you can set for yourself. Dr. Martin Seligman of the University of Pennsylvania spent more than 25 years studying the phenomenon of what he called learned helplessness. What Seligman concluded, after interviewing and studying many thousands of people, was that more than 80% of the population suffers from learned helplessness to some degree, and occasionally to a very high degree indeed. A person suffering from learned helplessness feels that he or she is incapable of achieving his or her goals, or improving his or her life. The most common manifestation of learned helplessness is contained in the words I can't. Whenever the victim of learned helplessness is offered an opportunity, possibility, or new goal, he immediately responds by saying, I can't. 
He then goes on to give all the reasons why a particular goal or objective is not possible for him. I can't move ahead in my career. I can't get a better job. I can't take time off to study. I can't save money. I can't lose weight. I can't start my own business. I can't start a second income business. I can't change or improve my relationship. I can't get my time under control. Whatever it is, he always has a self-limiting reason that immediately slams on the brakes of his potential. It short-circuits any attempt or desire to set a new goal or to change things in any way. Another famous observation of Henry Ford was, if you believe you can do a thing or you believe you cannot, in either case, you are probably right. Learned helplessness is usually caused by destructive criticism in childhood, negative experiences growing up and failure experiences as an adult. The way you get over this natural tendency to sell yourself short is by setting small goals, making plans and working on them each day. In this way, you gradually develop greater courage and confidence, like building up a muscle. As you become more confident in yourself and your abilities, you can set even larger goals. Over time, your doubts and fears will weaken and your courage and confidence will grow and become the dominant force in your thinking. Eventually, with a record of successes behind you, it won't be long before you become unstoppable. The second mental obstacle that you need to overcome is the comfort zone. Many people become complacent with their current situations. They become so comfortable in a particular job or relationship, or at a particular salary or level of responsibility, that they become reluctant to make any changes at all, even for the better. The comfort zone is a major obstacle to ambition, desire, determination, and accomplishment. People who get stuck in a comfort zone, combined with learned helplessness, are almost impossible to help in any way. Don't let this happen to you. The way that you get out of your comfort zone, and break loose from learned helplessness, is by setting big, challenging goals. You then break these goals down into specific tasks, set deadlines, and work on them every day. Like an ice flow breaking up in the spring, soon the sluggishness and lethargy of learned helplessness and the comfort zone breaks up and you begin moving faster and faster toward accomplishing more and more of what is possible for you. Once you have made a list of all the obstacles that are standing in the way of your achieving your major goals, organize the obstacles by priority. What is the largest single obstacle? If you could wave a magic wand and remove one major obstacle from your path, which one obstacle, if removed, would help you the most in moving ahead more rapidly? Management consultant Ian Mitroff has an interesting set of observations with regard to problem solving and the removal of obstacles. He says that, whatever the problem, to find it several different ways before you attempt to solve it. Beware of any problem for which there is only one definition, or only one solution. When you ask the question, with regard to your goal, why am I not there already, what answer comes to mind? What is holding you back? What is standing in your way? It is at this point that you have to drill down to determine the correct obstacle before you begin taking steps to remove it. You do this by asking the question, what else could be the problem, after each definition of the problem. In my work with corporations, or with individuals, we start off with the goal of doubling our profits or doubling our income. I then ask, why is it that our profits or our income are not twice as high already? By repeated questioning, we often come up with an answer that is quite different from the obvious answer. Here is an example of the questioning process. We are not making enough sales. What else could be the problem? Our individual sales are not large enough per customer. What else could be the problem? Our advertising is not attracting enough customers. What else could be the problem? As you can see, Whichever of these obstacles turns out to be the correct problem will require a completely different course of action to solve it. If we don't have enough sales, our solution is to increase the number of sales. If our sales are not large enough per customer, our solution is to increase the size of sale per customer. If our advertising is not drawing enough customers, our solution is to improve the quality of our advertising in some way. You could say, our customers are not buying enough from us. What else could be the problem? Our customers are not buying frequently enough from us. What else could be the problem? Our salespeople are not selling enough to our customers. This could lead to totally revamping the quality of the sales force through better recruiting, training and management. What else could be the problem? Our customers are buying too many of our products from our competitors. What else could be the problem? Our competitors are selling too much of their products to our customers. This answer forces you to ask. What value or benefit do our prospective customers see in purchasing from our competitors? 
How could we offset this perceived benefit? What else could be the problem? We are not making enough profit on our sales. What else could be the problem? It costs us too much to make each sale. What else could be the problem? And so on. Each new definition of the problem suggests different ways that the goal of increased sales or profitability could be achieved. In the business book, The McKinsey Way, describing the management consulting practices of McKinsey and Company, the authors point out that one of the greatest wastes of time and money is in applying the wrong solution to the wrong problem in the first place. This can apply to your problems and obstacles as well. By identifying the constraints or reasons that you are not achieving your personal income goals, each definition leads to a different set of solutions. They require that you think in different ways. In your personal life, it is the same. The accuracy with which you identify the obstacles or bottlenecks that are holding you back will determine the appropriateness of the various steps that you can take to remove or alleviate those obstacles. You could start off by stating the problem in this way, I'm not earning enough money. What else is the problem? I'm not contributing enough value to be worth more money. What else could be the problem? I'm not good enough at what I do to be capable of getting results that are worth more than I'm earning today. What else could be the problem? I don't use my time efficiently enough during the workday. What else could be the problem? I spend my evenings watching television, my weekends socializing and I seldom read or learn anything that would help me to be better at my job. Once you have determined the major obstacle that is holding you back, rewrite that obstacle as a positive goal. For example, you could now say, my goal is to continually upgrade my skills and abilities so that I am in the top 10% of money earners in my field. You then make a list of all the things that you could do to upgrade your knowledge and skills, improve your time management, increase your efficiency and effectiveness and make more sales for your company. You set deadlines and measures next to each step in your strategy to achieve excellence in your field. You then select one key task and take action on it immediately. From then on, you hold your own feet to the fire. You become your own taskmaster. You discipline and drive yourself to do the things that you need to do to become the kind of person you need to become in order to achieve the goals that you have set for yourself. This exercise of identifying what is holding you back and then setting a clear, written goal to remove that obstacle puts you back in control of your own life. By following through on your resolution, you virtually guarantee your ultimate success and the achievement of almost any goal you can set for yourself. If you have any questions or concerns about the accuracy of your problem definition, discuss it with someone you know and trust. Put your ego aside. Invite honest feedback and criticism. Be open to the possibility that you have fundamental flaws and weaknesses that are standing in the way of your realizing your full potential. Be brutally honest with yourself. Once your problem or obstacle is clear to you, ideas, opportunities and answers will come to you from various sources. You will begin to attract into your life all kinds of resources that will help you to overcome the obstacle or difficulty, either within yourself or within the situation around you, and move you more rapidly toward your goal. Remember the old poem, for every problem under the sun, there is a solution or there is none. If there is a solution, go and find it. If there isn't, never mind it. For every problem or obstacle that is standing between you and what you want to accomplish, there is a solution of some kind somewhere. Your job is to be absolutely clear about what sets the speed at which you achieve your goal and then to focus your time and attention on alleviating that constraint. By removing your major obstacle, you will often make more progress in a few months than the average person might make in several years. I found in my research, is that this is curious of qualities to self made miners. If you have these qualities, your success is worth the guarantee, and if you don't have these qualities, the qualities are learnable. Point number one, is that all business or sales skills are learnable. All financial skills are learnable. If you can drive a car, you can learn any skill. You can drive a car, you can learn the skill. And number two, is you're probably only one skill away from doubling your income, right now. You're probably only one skill away from setting yourself on the road to becoming a self-made millionaire. That turns out to be the case for almost everyone. And if you don't know what that skill is, maybe over the course of the time we spend together, it'll jump out at you. But wherever it is, you've got to find it out and go and work on it because it is learnable. Learnable skill. People say, well, I don't know. I've never been very good with money. Well, yeah, over it. Fact of the matter is, you can learn what you need to learn to achieve anything. 
One of my seminar participants told me this. He said, money is like food. When you have enough of it, you don't think about it at all. But when you are deprived of it for any period of time, you think of nothing else. More people are achieving financial independence and becoming self-made millionaires today at a faster rate than ever before. The great majority of self-made millionaires and even self-made billionaires are first-generation success stories. This means they started their working lives with little or nothing and they earned it all from the first dollar. The fact that so many hundreds of thousands and millions of other people have gone from rags to riches in a single generation is ample proof that you can do it as well. You only need to learn how. It's really quite a simple thing to become a self-made millionaire. If you simply save $100 per month, year in and year out, from the age of 20 to the age of 65, and you invested that money in a well-managed mutual fund invested in the American stock market, you would earn an average of 10.8% per annum on your investment. At that rate, $100 per month would be worth more than $1,200,000 when you retire. The most successful people in every society are those with a long time perspective. They develop a long time horizon. They think and plan 10, 20, and even 40 years into the future. They then organize their daily and weekly activities in such a way that everything they do is consistent with the long-term goals they want to achieve. This is especially true with regard to achieving financial independence. You and everyone else has a series of goals, either clear or fuzzy. Each of these goals is organized in a hierarchy. Each of your goals is ranked, consciously or unconsciously, from your most important to your least important. The reason that people do not achieve financial independence is because, although it is a goal, it is not a primary goal. It is merely one of many goals that they think about from time to time. When it comes time to act or spend, their other goals, for immediate pleasure and gratification, for example, a precedence. It's only when you take the goal of financial independence and move it right up to the top of your hierarchy of values that you begin to get your financial life under control. Remember the great principle. You become what you think about most of the time. In thousands of interviews, researchers have discovered that self-made millionaires in the area of money think about financial independence most of the time. They organize their entire lives around saving and accumulating. They think continually about how they can earn or acquire more and better invest and deploy their savings. The fact is, you are not going to win the lottery. Unfortunately, there is no distant relative who is going to die and leave you a lot of money. You are not going to discover gold or make a lucky hit in the stock market. The only way that you are going to achieve financial independence is with long time perspective. By saving and investing your money month after month and year after year until you have enough, you never have to worry about money again. For most people, money means freedom, one of the highest of all human values. It means the ability to be and do what you want and that buy the things you need without worrying about the cost. Freedom is a powerful, driving force that has determined the course of human history. Yes, freedom, one of your values? For many people, some of the values associated with money are security, independence, success, status, pleasure, and even love, especially the love and respect of others. So, what are your personal values with regard to money? Here's an important point. If you have negative values with regard to money, these values can sabotage you throughout your entire life. One of the smartest things that you can do for the rest of your life is to admire, respect, and look up to people who have achieved financial success. This is because you always move in the direction of that which you most admire and respect. The more you admire and respect financial success, 
the more likely you are to do the same things that financially successful people do. Eventually, you'll become the kind of person who achieves financial success yourself. Imagine that your financial life was perfect in every respect. Create a clear mental picture of your distant financial future as if your every financial dream had been realized. What does it look like? How much would you like to be worth when you retire or stop working? What kind of a lifestyle would you like to have at that time? How much will you have to save and invest every month, every year, to reach your long-term financial goals? These are questions that most people seldom ask or answer. Imagine that you have no limitations on your long-term ability to achieve financial independence. Imagine that you have all the time and all the resources that you require. Imagine that you have all the knowledge and all the experience you need. Imagine that you have all the contacts and all the opportunities you could ask for. If you could design your financial life to be perfect in every way with no limitations, what would it look like? Imagine that you have finally achieved a net worth of $10 million. What would you do? How would you change your life if you were completely independent financially? Make up a dream list of every single thing you would want in your life, tangible and intangible, as you have all the money you would ever need. The greater clarity you have regarding your long-term financial future, the faster you will attract people and resources that you will need to achieve it into your life, and the more rapidly you will realize your vision. In general, you should have four financial goals. First, you want to earn as much as you can. Second, you want to spend as little as you can. Third, you want to save and invest as much as possible. And fourth, you want to protect yourself against unexpected reversals and losses. The achievement of each of these goals is very much under your control. Perhaps the best measure you can use, if financial independence is your goal, is to determine how much money you will need each month, each year, to live comfortably and then calculate how long you could sustain your current lifestyle on your current savings. This number is called your run rate or your burn rate. This is a calculation of how long you can survive with what you have accumulated up to now. This is the best measure of your overall financial health. This is a great focal point. Set clear financial goals and targets for each part of your financial life both for the short term and for the long term. Examine every expenditure in your life and look for ways to reduce your monthly living costs. Set a goal to cut your expenses by 10% or 20% over the next 90 days. Make cost control and cost cutting a regular part of your life, no matter how much you earn. Since you become what you think about most of the time, the more time you spend thinking about your money, better you will become in terms of managing it. The first knowledge that you will require to achieve financial independence is the knowledge of exactly how much you are earning today, how much you are spending each month, and how much you are worth right now. You should keep a list of every dollar you spend and analyze your list regularly. The more attention you pay to your day-to-day -day spending, the smarter and more aware you will become regarding the amount of money flowing through your fingers. Here's a rule that will virtually guarantee that you become wealthy over the course of your working lifetime. Save and invest 50% of any increase that you earn in your salary or compensation for the rest of your career. You can still spend the other 50% of the increase on improving your standard of living. But resolve today to save half of every increase for the rest of your career. This discipline alone will assure that you achieve financial independence and probably several years before you expect to. Apply the 80-20 rule to your job every day. Identify the 20% of your tasks that account for 80% of the value of everything you do. Resolve to focus more and more of your attention on becoming better and better 
those few activities that are worth more than all the rest. There are certain habits and behaviors that lead inevitably to financial success. The first and most important habit is for you to pay yourself first. As George Klassen wrote in his classic book, The Richest Man in Babylon, a part of all you earn is yours to keep. Pay yourself first, off the top. Your goal is to eventually save 10% to 20% of your income throughout your life. Your aim should be to put this amount away regularly, to invest it with experts, and to let it grow over time. If you cannot afford to save 10% of your income, begin by saving 1% of your income. Begin saving and investing, even before you pay off your debts. Begin putting money away before you pay down the amounts that you owe. This is very important. By developing the habit of saving a certain percentage of what you earn off the top of every single paycheck, you will eventually change your entire attitude towards yourself and money. The most important habit you can develop to achieve financial independence is the habit of frugality. Carefully consider every expense before you make it. If possible, delay a large purchase for a day, a week, a month, or even longer. Take that time to think about it before you commit. Perhaps the most helpful habit of all is for you to learn to enjoy the very act of saving and investing. When you begin to look forward to every opportunity to put money away, you change your entire attitude toward money and investment you begin to get tremendous pleasure and satisfaction from seeing your savings and investments grow over time. There are four activities that you should engage in every single day to guarantee that you achieve financial independence. The first is to carefully evaluate every expenditure before you make it. Delay every expenditure that you possibly can. Put it off until later if you make it at all. The second thing that you should do is to set clear goals and targets for the amounts that you intend to earn and keep. Measure your results against these targets every week and every month. What gets measured gets done. The third activity is for you to look for ways to reduce your monthly expenditures and instead save the money. Cut out all non-essential expenses. Keep asking yourself, do I really need this? And if you don't, don't buy it or don't spend it. Set it as a goal to reduce your monthly cost of living by as much as you can as quickly as possible. Remember, every dollar that you can save from your monthly expenses is an additional dollar that you can put into your financial freedom account. The fourth activity is for you to take every opportunity you possibly can to increase your value, to increase your earning ability. Look for ways to upgrade your knowledge and skills. Concentrate on getting better at those activities that contribute the greatest value to yourself and your company. Become totally focused on making more and saving more every single day. Financial success is predictable. It has never been more possible for you to earn and keep more money than it is today. There are hundreds of thousands and even millions of self-made millionaires all of whom started with nothing and who began using the practices and processes described in recession. Your job is to become one of them. And now, today. Imagine that there's two types of work that you do. There's work that we will call work number one, right? And this work is work that has big potential consequences. If you do this and you do it well, it makes a big difference in your life and your family and everything else. The other type of work you do are what we call two, number two work, and this work has no potential concept. So the work first category of work moves you toward your most important goals faster than anything else. This other type of work does not move you toward your goals, and even worse, it moves you away from your goals. All the examples of time that you waste doing things of no value. So here's a simple way to become one of the highest paid and most productive people in society is do only number one task. Do only those things that are moving you every day 
toward the goals that you say you want to achieve. You want to earn more money, be happier, healthier, move up in your business, have a nice house and a car, travel. Only do those things all day long. If you only do those things, the things that have great potential consequences, it transforms your life. Now here's another discovery. 95% of what you do comes from habit. And if you do something repeatedly over and over again, what do you develop? You develop a new habit. You've heard the rule, the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle, that the top 20% of salespeople make 80% of the sales, that the bottom 80% of salespeople make 20% of the sales. You know, you know what the difference, the ratio is there? The ratio is the difference between 16 to 1. That the average income of people in the top 20% is 16 times the average income of the people in the bottom 80%. Now let me ask you a question. Does it mean the people in the top 20% are 16 times better than the people in the bottom 80%? 16 times more experience? Do they work 16 times the number of hours? Do they have 16 times the number of years of education? Are they 16 times more handsome? Are they 16 times anything? You know that it's not humanly possible to be twice as smart as somebody else. Sure. Looking at very, very unintelligent people and very, very brilliant people, it's just really not humanly possible on average for us to even be twice as smart as anybody else. But 20% of these people are making 16 times the average risk. In our society, it is a lot of controversy over why should I work so hard for my job? The fact of the matter is that less than 5% really succeed. That's less than 5% of the population really succeed at life. Of 100 people working today, only one will be wealthy when they retire. Four will be financially independent. 15 will have some savings. 80% will be broke and dependent upon charities and pensions. Only 1 or 2% of people in each generation really makes it in life. And every single study, those people who make it are those who work hard, hard, hard. And if you think that it's hard to be successful, try being a failure. Try coming to the end of the trail with no money, dependent upon pensions, and you don't know what hard is until you try living like that. But if you work hard, the average self-made millionaire in America works 12, 13 hours a day. Works about 60 to 65 hours a week. I'll tell you this with regard to hard work, that you, in our society you only work 8 hours a day for survival. Everything over eight hours is for success. If you're only working eight hours a day, you're in trouble. If you're only working eight hours a day, you better have some rich uncle, or you better have somebody else who's going to take care of you because eight hours a day only gets you survival in our society. Because it's so competitive that somebody else is working nine, they've got an edge on you. Somebody else is working ten, they've got a bigger edge on you. Every hour over eight that you invest is an investment in your future, is an investment in your success. If you put in the hours over eight, whether it's studying or reading or working, if you put in the hours, it will pay off and it will pay off in spades. It's like throwing seed in the ground. You throw a seed in the ground, the plant that comes up is not just one seed, it's hundreds of seeds. There's a crop that you put in, but you must put the seed in the ground first. The market only pays excellent rewards for excellent performance. It pays average rewards for average performance. It pays below average rewards for below average performance. And I talk to men and women all over America who are unhappy and they're sad and they don't like their work and you know why? It's because they're not good at what they're doing. So your earning ability is the most powerful and most valuable financial asset you have. And your earning ability, by definition, is your ability to get results that people will pay you for. Now, this doesn't mean that you are not a valuable person. Each human being is of incredible value. But some people's earning ability is much higher than others. And your earning ability is an asset, so it can be either increasing in value or decreasing in value. Now here's what they study, here's what they found in the studies, the 80-20 rule. They found that the bottom 80% of people, the ones who struggle for money and worry about money all their lives, these people, when they take their first job, will work to a certain level, and then they will level off and never improve for the rest of their lives, unless they're forced to. And so therefore, 10 years after starting work, the average person today is no more productive at getting results than they were after one year. But they find that the people in the top 20% are very different. The people in the bottom 80% increase their income about 2 or 3% per year, for the years. People in the top 20% increase their income at an average of about 11% per year. If your income goes up 11% per year, you will double your income every six or seven years. And then you will double it again 
and then you'll double it again, and soon you'll live in a beautiful house, and you drive a nice car, and you'll send your children to private schools, and you'll have a nice bank account, and you'll be happy. But if you don't keep increasing your income, nothing good will happen. Now, what is the difference? The answer is the people in the bottom 80% don't learn anymore after they leave school. But the people in the top 20% are always learning new things. And as a result, they are increasing their earning about it. People in the top 10% in every field think in terms of their hourly rate. How much I earn each hour. Now, this change in thinking changes your entire life. I know because I've taught this principle to thousands of people who literally transform their lives and their incomes almost overnight. If you think in terms of how much you earn in a week or a month, well, then you have a natural tendency to waste time during the day. Monday is a slow day. You're recovering from the weekend. Tuesday, you start to work. Wednesday, the week is almost over. Thursday, you start to slow down. And now it's Friday. Who gets anything done on Friday? We'll do it on Monday. And so people's ability to produce drops, drops, drops. And since 80% of the population thinks like this, if you're not careful, you'll find you are surrounded by people who waste time. So when you start thinking in terms of your hourly rate, it transforms your life. Poor folks have poor ways. It's really hard, you know. Poor folks have poor ways. I always remember that poor folks have poor ways. They think poor. They think cheap. They think about saving. They think of spending as little as possible. They think of the little money they have. But you find, you find that successful people have just successful thinking. They think very, very differently than, than poor people. And so remember that poor folks have poor ways, but rich folks have rich ways. It's because people who make a lot of money, my friend Jim Brown said, he said, the, 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 the most important part of becoming a millionaire is not the money. But it's the person you have to become to become a millionaire. You have to become a totally different person to go from zero to being worth more than a million dollars. But the good news is that if you lost all of your money because of a crash in the economy or something else, you could make it all back again because now you're the kind of person who can make it. Once you become a millionaire in your thinking, then you could do only a matter of time before you quickly restore that amount of money in your reality. So the starting point is to change our thinking, which we have said over and over again. And I've written extensively on this. But the path of least resistance is a really big killer. What it is, is the tendency to look for the easy way, the fast way, the cheap way, the, the, the method of least effort or least cost to achieve things. And what we have in our society today, which is as a result of several generations of affluence, is we have an enormous number of people who are literally addicted to the shrink, the easy way, the fast, quick way. Um, there's, there's an old saying with regard to these get-rich-quick schemes where a man uh, with experience meets a man with money. The man with money is going to end up with the experience and the man with experience will end up with the money. So you'll find that the newspapers and magazines and television are all full of get-rich-quick schemes. Because there's always people who think it's possible to get rich quick, get rich easy. All you have to do is find a trick or a gimmick. And there's an enormous number of people who say which people are just people who are lucky, you know, they just had a gimmick. They just, it was a trick. The fact is that the rich have been studying it great life. It takes about 22 years from the time you decide to become a millionaire before you hit a million dollars net worth X your house. It takes about 22 years on average, based on the studies of many thousands and tens of thousands of self-made millionaires. People say, wow, that's a long time. If it is, get on with it. So people start at 20, by the age of 42, they're millionaires. By the age of 45, they're dual millionaires. By the age of 50 or 55, because as we say, the first million is hard, the second million is inevitable. And so what you do is you have to make the first million. Why? It's because you have to become a very different, disciplined, higher form of human being to actually make such a contribution that you actually earn and hold on to more than a million dollars. It forces you to become somebody really different than you've ever been before. Financial freedom is a real big issue today. Financial freedom means that you don't worry about money. Worries about money, by the way, are the number one reason for marital breakdown. Worries, uh, disagreements, arguments over money. So if you have problems with money, they affect your relationship. If you have problems in your relationship, they affect your, your health. If you have problems in your health, they affect your peace of mind. And money is a major issue. We've been living through the most affluent uh, country, well, in the most affluent time in all of human history for the last 50 years. 
We've grown up in a level of affluence that is unimaginable for 95% of the world. And we've come to believe that this is what we're entitled to. You grow up in America, you're told to a fat life. One of the things that is leading to major, major social disruptions is a lot of people are finding it's not true anymore. It's today, if you want to be financially successful, you won't have to work very, very hard. You're going to have to get up early and get a car and work all day and work into the evening. You're going to have to work six days a week. There are no, six, no wealthy people who work five days a week. Zero, nada, nicht, the end of shows. None. There's no successful people who work five days a week. Because if you work five days a week, you actually only work about four and you start late, you leave early and you waste time all day long. Successful people work long days and they work into the weekend. However, they're doing something they enjoy and they're doing something they get tremendous satisfaction from because they're making progress and as a result, it's really not work. But you know the old rule, I found something I love to do and I never worked again the rest of my life. I worked six, seven days a week but I never worked a day. And you'll find that when you do that, which you will before we're finished, when you start to find what it is that you love to do and put your whole heart into it, you never work again and you get paid more than you've ever dreamed of and you never even care. You don't even count the money anymore because you're just getting so much satisfaction from using yourself at the very highest level. And so financial freedom, this is something we people have to start thinking about. The worst thing you can do today is to be in debt. You know, as, as they say, ah, the debt comes and goes, but the interest payments stay forever. It's the interest that shows you. It's the highest payment. Right. Um, so one of our goals is to achieve financial freedom. And this is something that happens by accident. We're going to say, well, geez, I'm not sure I'm financially free this morning. No, what we, have to, what we have to do is we have to set it down and make a plan and we have to work on it for a long, long time. It's not something you can do once, it's something you need to do throughout your career. And too many people today are deeply in debt. You know, 70% of Americans live from paycheck to paycheck. 70% of Americans. What that means is that they have no money. They have no reserves. The average American family at the age of 40 for the major breadwinner has a total net worth of about $40,000. And that's including the equity in their home. At the age of 60, they have a net worth of about $62,000. An average of about $1,000 a year. Most people without pensions, and that's why there's so much political controversy. Without pensions, most people would be destitute. They'd be impoverished because they have nothing. 70% have nothing. Why? It's not because they haven't earned a lot of money. You know that if you save $100 a month for your entire working lifetime, you'd be worth more than a million dollars when you retire. $100 a month. If somebody put a gun to your head, could you save $100 a month? Yes, if your whole future depended upon it, could you save $100 a month? Well, it does. And people don't even save that. They spend it and they buy stuff they don't need to impress people. They don't like. So here's when we start with what our entrepreneurs, we say there's four keys. One is to clarify. Clarity is 95% of your success. Be absolutely clear about who you are, what you want, and your goals. That thing is to simplify. Strip out and get rid of all of the extraneous things in your life that are bogging you down. Uh, number three is to maximize. And maximize is to take your special talents, abilities, and opportunities and really develop them to a high level. And number four is to lots of luck. And that is to leverage your talents and abilities. So here's the definition. We say clarify is develop absolute clarity about who you are. One of the things we do is we help people take assessments to determine who they are, what they like to do, what they're supposed to be doing, and we find that if you're in the wrong career for you, you'll never have any excitement about it. You'll never have any desire to get better at it. But if you change and you start doing what is right for you, you suddenly come alive. You become excited about what you're doing. So who you are, what you want, and the best way to achieve it. Clarity, clarity. Second is to simplify. Simplify means to delegate, outsource, and eliminate all low-value, no-value tasks and activities in your life. In other words, look at the things you do in your life that contribute very little, very little to your success, but you keep doing them anyway. And you'll find that about 80% of your life is trivial. Remember the 80-20 rule? 20% 20 of what you do accounts for 80% of your results, success, rewards, satisfaction, happiness, joy. Everything is in the top 20%. Which means the bottom 80% could be cut out completely and have no negative effect on your life. What do most people spend most of the time on? Bottom 80%. You know, television watching, since the last time we did this, I put this in the summer, a few months ago. At that time, it was 150 hours a month for the average of America. It's up to 158 hours in less than a year. Average Americans watching five and a half to six hours of, up, up, over five hours of television 
per day. Average non-adult is what is, is on social media five hours a day. Television watching, by the way, for young people is dropping dramatically. Networks are going bonkers. So there's older people who are not high tech, they watch television five hours a day. Just imagine if you took two of those hours and you read something worthwhile. You'd be rich in a few years. Television makes you poor. They, they did an interesting study. They took people's socioeconomic categories, Wall Street Journal. They found as you went down the socioeconomic categories to the poorest of the poor, they had, they had no books in their homes and the biggest televisions they could afford. As you went up to the top, and, and they watched about seven hours of television a day. As they began to go up in terms of income, television watching decreased until they got to the five, top five or ten percent. These people very seldom watched television. They would pre-record something and watch it at their leisure. Uh, later on in the evenings or on the weekends, very seldom watched television and their homes were full. So if you want to get into the top ten percent, what you do is you have to do things at the top ten percent of people. The rules for achieving financial independence are simple. Rules are as follows. Rule number one is spend less than you earn. Five hundreds. And then so by invest the difference. This is always been the case. This is the key to financial success going back to the richest man in Babylon, Classen, more than 2,000 years ago. You can be a blithering idiot at an average job, working at a gas station on the farm, or driving a truck at an average wage, but you save save $100 a month on average from age 20 to age 65, and let it accumulate, you'll be worth more than a million dollars. $100 a month, $25 a week, but less than $4 a day. About the same amount as buying a latte costing Starbucks. Do you that? Okay, well, do lots of other things, but do that for sure. A rule number two for achieving financial independence is that 10% of every dollar you earn is yours to keep. What this means is that you need to develop it from the beginning of your career about 10% off the top of salary and living and the other 90%. Most people get their paycheck and they spend most of it. If there's anything left over, they throw it in the bank. Get rid of it. And then they grab it out and spend it on something else. They look at their bank account, shout, hey, we've got money here, let's rat it. Some people have just got to get rid of the money. Rule number three is resolve in advance to prefer financial independence status. The working the millionaire next door found that the mark of self made millionaires was that they weren't concerned about impressing the neighbors or keeping up with the Joneses. They were more concerned with financial independence than by looking good on the outside, at least until they became wealthy. So say to yourself, financial independence is number one to me. Status is number two, how almost three or four or ten. Then they will run here. It's up to Absolutely amazing what will happen to you financially. You know what we found out about South made nine years? So never buy new cars. Why? Because in a new car there's several thousand dollars of depreciation. Money that you lose the minute you drive it off the lot. So what South made millionaires do based on energy houses on it is they pick a car they wouldn't like. They file up in Consumer Reports and J.D. Power for quality and service, and then about two to three years out, they look for used models with low mileage and good service records. And then they buy a car that 20-25% in depreciation has already been taken out of. I worked with a man once who started with nothing and achieved a net worth of $800 million. But he lived in a nice and down on neighborhood, filled with doctors and lawyers and architects, but not ostentatious. The people living on either side of him were just two paychecks away from homelessness. If their income was cut off for two months, they wouldn't be able to make their mortgage payment. I had watched them. He drove the same used car for three or four years. He liked Cadillac, so he didn't Cadillac take a tow of it. Then he'd get another used or loaner vehicle from a dealership, but then it all that had been depreciated. It was never ostentatious at all, and he ended up one of the richest men in America. When he it, he'd be wearing an old sweater. He didn't have a huge wardrobe with the same suits to me, and he had no bills at all. But when he wanted to go somewhere, he'd fly in his private $25 million jet all by himself. Now back to the last rule for achieving financial independence. Rule number four is, once you put the money away, never touch it. Now this is important. So if you run it down, write it in red. You see, many of us make the mistake of thinking that if you save money, you can put that money away so you can have it. Done. 
So when they decide, I want to buy a car, or I want to go on a trip, I want a boat, one of them will go and get this money that you save. However, if you want to spend money on those things, set up a separate savings account. This money is for your financial security. This is your financial freedom fund. Once you put money into this financial freedom account, you lock it in. Like a one-way door, it goes in and it never comes out. You never spend it. I can tell you all kinds of stories about how this will change your life, including in my life. But as now, when you put it away and decide that you will never spend it, or is your concern it's gone forever? I personally will do whatever is necessary, no matter what my financial emergency is, not touch by financial fortune. Never touch it. Because if you even think even tiny glimmer, as you can doubt it, it's a move it, uh, then you'll find yourself meeting it at the first opportunity. So the key of financial success is pay yourself first. Save 10% off of your tip. Buy new things rather than new. But you put money away. Never, never put it away and that stay there so it accumulates and enables you to do anything you want in life. Today in America, it's a little different because of the state of the economy. And on test, of course, you can bought low and, and, and sold high, but very few said that. 20 to 20% per year after taxes expenses. Of growing, was it? In good golf, and it's ultimately achievable. So write down five figures representing your target net worth for the next five years. It seems remarkable, but the fact is that the starting point of increasing your income or your net worth is very simple. <laughs> Guess what it is? Decide to do it. Make a decision to become financially independent. You say, well, not that simple. Well, it is that simple. Just losing. Yes. Simple. I'm very reason that people don't succeed in life. This is because they never find to then back up decision termination. There are a lot of things you can do after you've made a decision. But there are a few things you can do before making a decision or without making a decision at all. But make that decision. Your decision may be wrong or it may be inaccurate. It's like a drawing a line in the ground. What if I don't get it by such a date? Worry about it. At least get it on paper. And take the first. Once upon a time, when I started my career, I sat down at the end of the year, and my tax returns were fourteen thousand four hundred dollars. Twelve years later, I sat down and did my tax return. The tax return your returns were one million four hundred forty thousand dollars. I increased my income by a thousand. I went back and started to look, and I realized that I. A formula which I gradually articulated into what I call the thousand formula. And it's very simple, based on the law of incremental improvement. The Japanese call it the Kaizen, the principle of continuous and better. Get a little bit better every day. So ask the question if you could increase your productivity, dominance, output by one tenth of one tenth. Right. Could you do that? Could you increase your productivity, performance, and output by one one thousand? And the answer is, if you were the tiniest bit more efficient, or worked a little bit harder on a more important task, you could become a tenth of a percent better in a day. But if you did that every single day for a week, it would be one tenth of one percent, five and one half percent more per hour. So is that possible? Of course. And you can, but you can, that's not that. I said, if you did that every week, that's all week. It'd be two percent more productive over the course of the month. If you did that every day for thirteen four-week months and two weeks, you would be twenty-six productive. Is that possible? And the answer is yeah. Is there is a thing in success called the momentum? Exactly. That means that once you start growing, it, you certainly as you keep going, go faster, faster. So once you become twenty-six that more productive in the course of a year, your overall output, your results, income will go up. Twenty-six. Since he is into the swinging, back to be more easy. more things done, which then earning him higher. So you may set better priorities. So if you do this twenty-six each year for ten years, you will be one thousand and four percent better. If this is what happened to me. And this happened to every single person I've ever worked with. Not long ago, I was in Seattle, and this young man came up to me. He's about thirty. I met him when he was about 22. He was working in a used car lot in a small town outside of Portland. 
and his name is Chris. And he came up and he said, uh, uh, Mr. Tracy, he said, do you remember me? I said, yes, this is a nice guy, great person. He said, well, you know that thousand percent formula that you taught to me many years ago? Oh, I said, well, of course I remember because I've talked to so many people. He said, Brian doesn't work. I said, it doesn't work. He said, it doesn't work. I said, I've used it every single day. Ever since, you, I learned it all those years ago, it doesn't work. He made a smile and said, it doesn't take 10 years. We took him down. He said, today, he said, I am earning 10 times what I was earning than in Michigan. He said, I used it every day. absolutely amazing. He said, I'm making more money today in a week or a month, but I was often making a month or a year just by using that corn. And what I did personally is I used it once and increased, increased my income 10 times, and then I used it again and increased my income 10 times more, 100 times in two years. That's so can you. There are two great principles of wealth attainment, and they're both equally important to understand and implement in order to be successful and acquire wealth. The first principle of wealth creation is make compound interest work in your favor. Einstein said that compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. Get that money in there and get it working for you. Interesting, Peter Lynch, uh, Mitch Allen said that it's not timing the market that makes you rich, it's time in the market that makes you rich. Remember, if you invest in one dollar at three percent at the time of Christ, you'd be worth all the money in the world today with compound interest. Compound interest is phenomenal. So make it work in your favor by getting the money in there early and leaking it there to work. The second principle of wealth creation is to use dollar cost averaging when you buy stocks. Don't worry about being right every time or getting the lowest price when you buy. It doesn't really matter unless of course stocks are overpriced at the end of the book. Why? If you invest a steady amount of money every week or every month or every year, then you'll end up buying things at the average price. The prices will go up and down, but you'll end up buying them high, buying them low, buying them average. Then for time, you would get the very best average deal. Dollar cost averaging is one of the great techniques for financial success. But here's an example of dollar cost averaging. Investing steady, steady, steady year after year. I have a good friend who came over here as an immigrant at the age of 17. Couldn't even speak English. So he began to learn English. And when he was 20 well, years old, he could speak enough English to begin studying financial success and going to college. Well, I had dinner with him not long ago in his four-acre property in his 16,000-square-foot home in a beautiful community on the East Coast. He's worth millions of dollars today. He owns banks and shopping centers and national corporations. Here's what happened. He was 20. Someone told him that real estate is the key to financial success. They're not making any more of it. You should own real estate. Well, he never thought about that. And at that time, he was a student and didn't have very much money. But he was working the evenings and weekends to pay for his needs, which that they used to do in those days. So he decided he would buy one piece of property each year. His first piece of property was in a small community outside of town, and it was a lot, and it cost $25 a month to it. He had to sweat bullets to make those monthly payments. His goal was to buy one piece of property a year, and he kept on doing it. He's now 49 years old. The last piece of property he bought last year was a $225 million shopping center. He still buys one property a year, only now. Much, much bigger. The skill and experience and discipline that he developed over time in buying those properties, which got bigger and bigger, made him a millionaire and a multi-millionaire. So, what's your excuse? What's our excuse? We're surrounded by hundreds, thousands, even millions of these stories. What is our excuse? It's always one thing. What is it? It's lack of discipline. So remember, two great principles of wealth creation are making compound interest and work for you by getting the money in there and working and using dollar cost averaging, whether it's buying stocks or real estate. Next is maximize. Determine your special talents, abilities, and strengths and focus on developing them to a higher level. And then multiply it is to leverage yourself and your business with other people's customers, other people's knowledge, other people's abilities, other people's efforts, other people's money, and other people's resources. And if we're the old saying it takes money to make money, yes, that's true, but it doesn't have to be your money. It could be somebody else's money. And all successful people have developed the ability to call on the money of others. Why? Because they do good work and they do good planning and they have a good care of their money 
The people line up to give them money. There's a, now we have trillions of dollars of money. Wait, I have a good friend, good my, my business partner is multi, multi millionaire. Started with that, tens of millions of dollars. And he's sitting on a pool of money that he keeps at very low levels of interest. He said, I can't find a place to put it. And I will not put it until I find the place. If somebody could come along with any kind of a business proposition, the person has credibility, track record, and has a good business proposition, there's more money available than you could dream of. Money is there in cards. It's like tsunamis of money that are available. So that's why when you read in the paper, you read it, some such company just paid $1.8 billion or 2.6 or 9.9 or Google just offered group on $6 billion cash for their business. There's lots of money for good business idea. But it doesn't have to be your money, it can be somebody else's. And your ability to attract that money that's the fire. Main part. Strategic planning is an essential part of the success formula. Your ability to create a clear and organized strategic plan will largely contribute to your success and wealth. In fact, it's virtually impossible to succeed greatly unless you have a clear idea of where you're going and how to get there. So here are three key factors to remember when devising a strategic plan. Number one is you are in business for yourself. This means that everything that is ever going to happen to your personal success corporation, your personal business, is up to you. No one else can be expected to do it for you. Now here is a perverse law. The more that you accept that you are responsible for doing whatever it is, the more others will line up to help you. So therefore you say these words, if it's to me, it's up to me. Now number two, your aim in strategic planning is to increase your return on energy. We call this ROE. Now the purpose of strategic planning in business is to increase return on budget. Are we? Return capital working in the organization. But your capital is mental, emotional, and human. Your job is to get the most out of your mental, emotional, and intellectual capital. To get, your job is to get the highest return on energy. My friend Cam Blanchard says you want to get the highest return on the amount of your life invested in your work. Number three. Successful individuals also have good personal strategic plan. Because a good strategic plan assures that you will get the highest return on the amount of energy that you invest in anything you do.